All right, it's uh, time for us to to begin our uh, class tonight. We're going through the attributes of God. We've uh, we've looked at the uh, omniscience of God. Uh, we've looked at the omnipotence, the omnipresence, and the eternal nature of God. And then we've gotten into the moral attributes of God. We've seen His holiness, His goodness, His faithfulness. And then last week we talked about His mercy. But today we're going to talk about the love of God. And it's interesting, the love of God has attributes from all of His other uh, uh, other aspects of his nature combined. Uh, and so we're really going to be going back into omnis- uh, omniscience, omnip- omnipresence, uh, omnipotence, and eternal nature as well, but combine love within it. But when I, I think about the, the love of God, the word specific for this is agape, and, and for the most part, within at least within the New Testament, uh, when the word agape is found, it is the love, the love of God, the love that God has for mankind, but it is a love that defines God. Uh, and so I, I, I was found it interesting, though, for looking at the, uh, the meaning of agape, and it made me think of this time of year. You know, I, I brought a coat, and I found that when we got in here, I didn't need the coat, so I just took it off. But this is the time of year where, you know, you know, uh, maybe if there was a, a fire going on in the fireplace and, and uh, you had a hot cup of coffee or, or a, cop, uh, a cup of uh, cocoa in your hand and you're just sitting there curled up by the fire. That's that great picture of warmth. Maybe the picture that, that I want you to think of as you, think, you hear this word for agape, the quality of a warm regard for an interest in another esteem, affection, regard, love, agape. Uh, so when we, we think about this, this idea of a warm regard that God has, we find that throughout Scripture. Uh, but it's, it's also interesting, there's three times within Scripture that we find something assigned to God, like God is. And, and specifically in John 4.24 and 1 John one five, I didn't hand those out. I'm just going to read them very quick. It says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So when it says God is spirit, there is no defi- definite article that is in front of that, that word spirit. So God is literally the, he is the epitome of spirit. He is the highest form of spirit. And because of this, he has no, there is no physical nature to God, and therefore he is, he is both in heaven and earth, and he is, he is uh, omnipresent. And we've discussed that at length. 1 John 1, 5 says, This is the message we've heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So God is literally the purest form of, of, of anything that we could imagine. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And so the third passage where we find what God is, is the concept of God is love. Who is 1 John 4, 7 through 8? All right, Rick, if you, can you read that for us? And, and uh, William, can you, or okay. David, I didn't see you have that too. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Amen. So God is love. He's literally defined by love. So since since there is no, no definite article in front of this, the fact that this is God is love. He is defined by it. Then when we've looked at all of the different qualities of God, it will apply to his love. And when we simply do that and we apply it to his love, I think it really helps to understand how loving God is and what, what that means for us in the day-to-day life. When we really can apply this to our lives. So God's love is omniscient. 
Uh, and I've actually, I've got seven points for this. And so seven, that's the number for complete. So maybe, maybe there's some perfection in that, uh, in, in looking at these, these qualities. But God's love is omniscient. Um, in Matthew 6, 8, uh, and 29 through 33, who, who has that? So, okay, yeah, thank you, Bob. Do not be like, like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So what is the all these things will be added to you? Verse 33, such an important but also quoted passage, what is the all these things referring to? What you'll eat, drink, and wear. Uh, and, and so notice that's what they're anxious about that Jesus is saying within this Sermon on the Mount. And the reason I ask Bob to read verse 8 and then uh, to go down, I know it's kind of in the middle of a context, but both verse 8 and verse 32 tells us that God knows what we need before we even ask it. So God is omniscient. He's all-knowing in his love. And the fact that he knows what we need before, before we ask it, that means his love can fulfill our, our needs. Uh, but knowing that seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added. Uh, these things come as a result, not a purpose. And they won't come in our time. They'll come in God's and in God's way. But God knows what we need. And, and so it, it tells me that his love is able to reach our need. But I, I find that it's important because if we say that, and we, we really could look at verse 33 and say, uh, all these things we added to you, oh, yay, now I get, a, I get the brand new car. Is that what that's saying? No, it, it, it's not about seeking first the kingdom of this world. Because when we seek first the kingdom of this world, then all these things, the things that I think I need in this world, will, will, I will assume will be added to me. But by seeking first the kingdom of God, then these things will be added to me. Uh, so again, it's, a, it's knowing that God's love is able to reach where we are is is of utmost importance. Any, any thoughts on this? Uh, Robert, did you have something? Yeah. yeah. William, can you come? <laughs> yeah, when, uh, when uh, God says you supply all our needs, then what you just read, uh, Matthew chapter 6, like 25, 26, and he was talking about uh, all these things that he uh, added to whatever. And the thing like what you could just quote, what you were saying is this here, for me to understand, you know, God supply all our needs. And just like uh, as we, as Christians, you know, God know what we want before we ask for it. You know, it ain't what we want, it's how God supply it to us, is he know mm -hmm. our needs. So we all gotta keep God to focus, he can supply our needs. Yeah. In verse 6, 23, 24, like he was talking about the birds, how the birds and add the flowers and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. If he take care of the birds and the lilies and the flowers, we know he's gonna take care of us. But we gotta seek ye first what? The kingdom, the kingdom of, God. of God. Exactly. Thank you very much. You're right. And uh, keeping that in mind, you know, and, and I love that Jesus <clears throat> often gives examples within nature for us to see how God knows all things and how God does take care of the birds and uh, the lilies of the, the field. Um, and 
recognizing this, you know, I think the, the more we see of God's creation, the more we're going to recognize that he hears us as well. So very, very great uh, observation, great point. Thank you. Um, all right, so the, the second is, is the love of God is, is omnipresent. It's meant to be everywhere. The love of God should be seen in everything and every, everyone. Um, <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians 12, 31 through 13, 8, who has that? Yes. All right, Rohan. But earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I'll show you a still more excellent way. Then 13, 8. 1 through 8. 13, verse 1, yeah. Oh. It's, but it's through. So, so we've got 12, 31, and then verses 1 through 8. Okay. So maybe I should have... If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bear, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endure, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Thank you very much. You know, when we think about this, I mean, this, this, is, this is the most beautiful, this is often said the most beautiful chapter within the New Testament. Uh, and what I found interesting, I, I remember I preached this lesson, uh, I preached through chapter 13. And Larry Judd happened to be visiting that day, and he came up to me after, and he said, did you notice chapter 12, verse 31? Well, I hadn't even referenced it in the lesson. And it ties the passage together. It ties the whole focus that is there. It says, he says, uh, earnestly desire the higher gifts. And he says, but I'm going to show you a still more excellent way. And, and I find it interesting when Jesus, when he tells the apostles that, you know, he had commissioned to be his fishers of men, to take the gospel message into all the world, make disciples of all, uh, of all the creatures. Um, you know, he tells them he's going to go away, and their response is their heart is troubled. So the response from Jesus is, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house are many rooms. And if it were not so, I would have told you. And he said, I go to prepare a place for you. So in, in, if we keep going there in, in chapter 14, and then 15, and then 16, he is explaining why it's important that he goes away because we talk about how Jesus was in the flesh. He's God in the flesh. That meant he was limited in space and time for the first century. And so it's important that the comforter would come and he would convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. So if you think about the, the love of God that would be able to be omnipresent in, in all places, it had to come through the Spirit but the greatest, the, the, the culmination of the, the gifts of the Spirit, the greatest concept is love that would permeate this world. And that's what God had in mind. The love of God is intended to be everywhere. And so when we see love, we are seeing God because God is love. 
And if you just, and if, I mean, think about if we just spent our lives striving to be this. I mean, it would transform the world around us. It would change. It would change everything. Um, love is patient. You know, I can be patient for a limited time, most of the time. Right? Because, you know, I, you know, I will, I can be patient if I've had a full night's sleep. I could be patient if I've had that cup of coffee. But if I haven't had that cup of coffee, if I hadn't had that night of sleep, it's so easy for us to give in to a perspective that, well, I, I had the right to do that because I'm tired. But when we look at this, love is patient. There's a consistency. It doesn't go away. And so none of us can look at this list and say, got it check, <laughs> fulfilled this. This is telling us we need to all continue to, uh, to do this. Uh, to, and we're going to be challenged on every single one of these. Um, and so that, that's, I, I feel it's important to bring out that, that God's love is meant to be everywhere. And he decided for it to be within his saints, within you and within me. So the world sees the love of God through you and through me. So when I'm not patient, people aren't seeing God. Uh, when, when I'm puffed up, they're not seeing God. Uh, if I'm boastful or envious, you, you name it, they're not seeing God. And that goes for you as well. So I, I think it's important as we look at the attributes of God, we've, we've constantly looked at these and seen that this is part of the moral quality of God that is meant to, to be within us, within our lives. It's meant to, to be seen and to be enacted. Uh, so how can God's love be in every place? I can't be in every place, I, but all of us together, collective, can be and must be, to represent the love of God. Because the world needs it desperately. Yes, Yvonne? We're talking that God is love. Mm -hmm. He doesn't try to love me. Right. He doesn't try to love you. He is. He cannot have any other expression other than love. Right. Even before we, when we were sinners, he still loved us. He still had planned to give us. So we are his hands. We are his feet. We are his children and our old people are dead. So rather than me trying to be patient because somebody jumped in front of me while I was driving, mm -hmm. I have to understand I am. I now have a new spirit. So now I don't get the freedom Right. to get offended because somebody says something ugly. Mm -hmm. I truly have to say, okay, how can I be a light in this situation? I'm going to be the last person that they see today that can give them some light. But if I fuss mm -hmm. back and I get offended and I'm, how dare you say that? So I think we have to begin to say, we already have his spirit and it is love and peace and kindness and goodness and faith and right. self-control. So rather than say, I'm trying to be patient, I am patient. Because the Spirit of God is with me. Mm -hmm. I don't have that luxury that I can't even be angry with my brother. I think once we say who we are, then we don't have to try so hard. Because you know point. who you are. It will come as a result. Yeah, and, and I'm glad you brought out the fruit of the Spirit. Because the, the, the first one mentioned is love. And the, you think about what the fruit is, it's going to be the result. The fruit is the, that's the last thing you see on the tree. It is the result of being within, the, within, that, within that tree. Being in the Spirit, the result will be love, joy, peace, and so on and so forth. Uh, so you're right. So if we try to purpose, it's like I'm going to try to love this person. That's when that's, that's, getting, that's getting it backwards. <laughs> so love is going to come as a result. So very well said. Uh, so this is how God intended for his love to 
to be everywhere through you and through me. Uh, all right, so again, God's love is omnipotent. God's love is all-powerful. God's love is strong, and it won't budge. You know, in the same way, you know, if, if we're talking about an earthly love, then I can love for a limited time until it doesn't benefit me anymore, right? I can love for, you know, un, you know until, until someone double-crosses me or does something. That can happen, right? And again, I'm saying, I'm, I'm putting myself in this. I'm just putting it out there, right? And this is why it's, it's, it's hard for us to look at this and say, wait a minute, God's love will never budge. It will never move. It is all-powerful. Love, his love is strong. Deuteronomy 7, 7 through 8. Who, who has that? All right. <clears throat> the Lord did not set love upon you, nor, nor chose you because you were more in numbers than any peoples. For you were not, for you were, for you were the fearest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you, and and because He would keep keep the oath which He has sworn unto you, to your father. Has the, has the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the, from the hands of Pharaoh's king of Egypt? So notice, thank you very much. Notice how, how God is, is speaking concerning Israel and why he loves them. Do you notice... Do you notice where the love that God has for Israel comes from? Did you notice what it said? It says where it doesn't come from. It says, It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all the people. So it had nothing to do with their, their number. It had nothing to do with merit. It wasn't about them as to why God chose them to, to love them. But look at verse 8. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand. So if you think about the, why the love of God is all-powerful and why his love for Israel was so strong, it was because of himself. It was because of his oath that he made and because of the sovereignty of God, he was going to follow through with what he said. And his love was so strong is why he remained patient with Israel. That's why he showed a consistent love that would not budge from them. What would have happened if it was the reverse? If his love for Israel was because of Israel? What was that? It, it wouldn't have lasted, it, it, exactly, because the moment they, um, they murmured, you know, and I find it interesting, uh, there, were, there were 10 major times that they, uh, that they turned their, their back on God and murmured in the, the wilderness, and it was the 10th time that meant that they had to go into uh, to wilderness wandering. 10 times God proved that he was the God of creation to, to Israel within Egypt because of the ten plagues that went against the gods of Egypt. And, it, and he, ha, he showed patience that for that amount of time, but it was because of the promise he made to Abraham that he did not go back on his word. And so the love of God, it is a mighty love, and it will never, uh, it will never go away. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, 2 Timothy 1, 6 through 9. Yes, Tim. Deuteronomy 2. Yes. He, he didn't choose them because they were the largest. Right. Because we had, they might have thought success we have is not by the love of God, but by our strength. Great he point. He chose them as the smallest. And so when they're successful, they've got to know that's by the power of God. Wow. And see, that, that applies later on with Gideon. You know, you think about the, the, the armies of Gideon. What did it get down to 300, I believe? 
you know, and, you know, it had to show that the power was in God and not in them, right? So that's a great, great point. There's a consistency throughout. Um, any, any, other, any other thoughts on that? I thought I saw a hand. Um, okay. Tim, thank you very much. First Timothy chapter, second Timothy, excuse me, chapter one, verses six through nine. Hence, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. Do not be ashamed then of testifying <clears throat> to our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering and the gospel or for the gospel and the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not in virtue of our works, but in virtue of his own purpose and the grace which he gave us in Christ Jesus ages ago. Mm, amen. So notice what Paul's telling Timothy that there is that God gave us a spirit not of timidity or of fear, but of power and love and of self-control. So there is there's power in the love that God has given us. And notice it wasn't because of our works in verse 9, but because of his own purpose and grace. That is the greatest power. And, and we recognize that might. We recognize the, the providence of God in even sending Christ to this earth in the way that he did. That shows the power of God and that he was willing to fulfill his promise to us. And that's how we have the love of God. Because he made it possible for us to have Christ. Without Christ, there is no love. And with, with Christ, we're able to love others. So his purpose is sovereign. His purpose is what will, will make it to where it, his love will never budge. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Yes, you have that. Blessed be the Father, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Amen. So notice he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. That is, that's the power of God. Because none of us can, none of us can do that. When I mention that story about Marquis Grissom and, and how this, um, the security guard, this woman had said to him, when you catch the last ball of the, of the, the last out to win us the World Series, I want the ball. And that was in the third inning. She just, she just guessed it. There was no, she didn't see that beforehand. But he was blown away by the fact that she had even called it. He gave her the most prized possession of the game. And that's, that's phenomenal. And that's why he shared it. And, I, and when I saw that, I thought, oh, that's so neat. But when we stop and we actually see what God knew before the foundation of the world that he was going to send Christ and see everything, and he was able to make it happen, that is truly powerful. He called it beyond a game. <laughs> it's life. And, and, and what I love about this passage, the ESV brings out in verse 4, it says, in love he predestined us for adoption as sons. Um, it, it brings that into, into the sentence, and uh, either way, it still works, but in, in love he predestined us. The, the reason he chose us in him before the foundation of the world is because he loved us. It's because of his love, that, that powerful love that he had in the purpose of his will is why he chose us in the first place to be adopted as sons. Why would we have to be adopted as sons? Because he knew we were going to fail. He knew he knew that we would sin. He knew that he was going to send Jesus before man ever chose to sin. 
He knew what he was going to do. And that shows incredible love. Um, you know, have you ever been working on um, an art piece, something? It could be anything. Anything can be art that you're working hard on. And the moment you mess up, what is the temptation? Yeah, crumple it up and throw it away. I remember uh, I took a picture, and I should have brought it with me, but um, I crumpled up the piece of paper before I even began the picture. I was like, I'm just going to get that out of the way now, and we're not going to have a problem. So I crumpled it up, and I unra- unraveled it, and I, I just drew in the lines. And I bolded the lines where I wanted the picture to be made, and I asked people to look at it, and no one ever guessed it. <laughs> okay. Now, it was a dragon, and you could see the dragon if you looked at it, but then someone else saw a wolf. And I didn't intend for it to be a wolf, but I looked at it and said, that's a wolf. I see the wolf. But what was fantastic was it, it literally started with the mistake and then it just, it just became a picture for anybody. And it was fantastic, and you could find purpose in it. And it, it made me think of uh, Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. Allow Him to draw the picture. And what the Scriptures are is the picture that God had in mind before the foundation of the world. So it is almost like He crumpled up the paper before the mistake ever took place, and we have the picture, and that is God's love. I should have brought that picture. I'll I'll bring it some other time. You'll see it, maybe for devotional. And you'll be like, what was he talking about? I don't see it. Uh, But anyway, yes. Oh, yeah, Rodney. William's William's coming. Thank you for the speed there, William. Man, that's good. I think that's one of the reasons when in Genesis 1-1 when he says, let us make man in our image, Mm. he had that image in his mind long before creation. Oh. So when he says, he, you know, let us make man in our image, I think that's what he's talking about. I've never thought of that in my life. Because God doesn't have an image because he's spirit. But the fact that we are all consistent, we, we all represent the image of God. He had a picture in mind before the foundation of the world. He had you in mind. You literally represent that picture he had in his mind. I think that's, thank you for bringing that out, uh, seriously, because that, that gives us, God knew us before we ever existed. And it actually brings it to John 17. Jesus prayed for his apostles specifically, but he also prayed for those who would believe through the apostles. So he prayed for you and he prayed for me. He had your face in, in mind. And that made me think of this very well, could have been, in the beginning, when God says, let us make man, Jesus had you in mind as well at the same time. Powerful. Uh, so we, we, have, we have five five minutes left. Let's see. Um, it's also, the fact is that God's love is immutable. It's unchanging. Uh, and I think we could really say this is one and the same. That's why I have them, them side by side. But James 1, 16 and 17, who has that? Right, yes, Steve. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. So the shifting shadow. All right, I want to, I want you to, okay, if I I do this, all right, and I have the light above me, and and, and you, you may be able to see, may be able to see my shadow. You might be like, what on earth is he doing? All right, did you, but did you see my shadow? You didn't? You couldn't? I could. Maybe there. Well, you can already see it. Everyone put your hand up and just look down. You'll see your shadow. You don't need to do that. You know it. I understand. But we all have a shadow because we are all changing. But the fact is that God is light. He's the father of lights, and there is no shifting shadow. There is no variation of shadow due to change because he's the source of the light. He has no shadow. So that means he's unchanging. And so the fact is that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all, and God is love. That means his love is unchanging. 
His love has no dark side. His love, which what's the dark side of love? It's hate. God is love. Um, and so, I, uh, very important, Romans 8, 35 through 39. Uh, all right, Ben. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than victorious through him who loved us. Mm. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Because his love is sovereign, his love is unchanging, it's immutable, then there is nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. But notice, we can be separated from one another in this life. We can experience death, and, we, and, and many have, and we, none of us are leaving this, this world alive unless Jesus... Uh, returns before that takes place. But what he's, so what he's talking about is separating us from the love of Christ. That love is there. And so if, if, if you feel like God is far away, the question remains, who moved? God did not move because he is not moving. Uh, and so that's, that is so important for us as we're, as we're discussing this. And our, our time is coming to a close. But let's go to the sixth. That, that also brings the fact that God's love is eternal. It's, in, it's, it's not going to move, but it's also not going to move forever. Eternally. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 1 through 3. Who has that? Yeah, Rodney. At the same time, saith the Lord, will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus saith the Lord, the people which were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause him to rest. And the Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Mm. I have, I, I found it specifically, I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. That brings me back to that picture, by the way. It's a different drawing, but still, let's apply it. Uh, you know, this idea of the love that he has is an everlasting love. Lamentation 3, 22 through 24, just one book over. Same author. Who has it? Yeah. M Merrill, yeah. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. Amen. And we also have, uh, ESV brings out the Lord, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Uh, but because of that, uh, there's an alternate reading. Because of the steadfast love of the Lord, we're not cut off. Uh, and so the reason... This is important to know that his love is eternal. We're not cut off. It doesn't, um, his love will not fall short. Um, but our sin will cause us to fall short. Uh, but he's made, it, he's made it possible to bring us the rest of the way. Uh, and that is only through him. Uh, so God's love is holy, and that's the last, that's the last point. Uh, and I wanted to... Uh, to read specifically, our, our time is is gone, um, but Hebrews twelve five through nine I think would establish this. David, gotten the exhortation that addressed you as sons, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him, for the Lord disciplines the one whom the one He loves and chastises every son whom He receives. It is for discipline that you have. Uh, it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? 
If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? So God's love is holy and he expects us to be holy as well. Uh, and there it, it takes, we're, we're going to experience the discipline of the Lord. Notice it says the Lord disciplines the one he loves. So that gives an even more depth to the concept of his love. And I'd like for us to finish, and I'll just read it very quickly. 1 John 4, 9, 12, and then 18 through 21. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Uh, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. There, there is, in verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. But if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. The love of God is meant to be portrayed in your life and my life in the way that we interact with one another. And all of these seven qualities of God must uh, shine through our lives. And as a result, we'll see the love of God. And the love of God is something that will, will never be gone. And there are people who are saying, where is the love of God? And they need to see it in you. And they need to see it in me. Yes, y Yvonne? William? I was thinking when, when we were discussing, number one, that we are in his image. And number two, he predestined us before the world was even created. We don't like to think of it as people commanding us to love Mm -hmm. But it is a commandment from God that we love him. Yes. And we love him with all our, And that is because the way he made us, he knows that we're only going to be happy if we're in line with him. That's right. And his will, because that is the way he made us. And I just thought it was wonderful. I just listened to his image and he created us. And, and I was like, we have to understand it is a command. Yes. Because that's the only joy that we're going to truly have. If you love me, keep my commandments. A a amen to that. Um, okay, thank you so much. And uh, let's, uh, da David Hayes, can I get you to lead us in a closing prayer? Sure, let's pray. Holy and righteous and all loving Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your love for us uh, and for the fact that uh, it's all powerful and it never changes and all the other attributes that we discussed tonight. Father, help us to try to emulate um, your love in our lives towards other people. Um, help us to um, always put you first in our lives and always put ourselves last. And we pray all these things through your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.